going on? How are we doing? Excited to be here with you guys. This is going to be fun. We're in Genesis 3, which is a happy chapter of Scripture. If you guys want to go ahead and turn uh, to Genesis 3, uh, and as we walk through uh, the year of the Bible, obviously it's important for you to bring your Bibles. I know we'll have verses on screen uh, for you, but you want to open up your Bible and you want to use it. And while you're turning there, uh, I want to remind you that at one point in my life, I was a dynamic basketball player. I played in a middle school intramural league, so that should tell you how good I was. It was an intramural league. I was offensively gifted. I one time scored 12 points in a season. It was awful. It was terrible. But I kept going out there. I think my parents felt like I needed some exercise. So I went in there and played basketball. And one time I was playing a game. I played on the Bulls. Again, intramural. So I played on the Bulls. And I rocked the number 23, appropriate. And uh, I, I trapped a guy on the baseline. He had picked up his dribble and he had nowhere to go. And again, I knew enough about basketball to know, like, I got this guy. And so uh, he wanted to uh, do something. I don't even know if this is legal. Uh, he wanted to knock the ball off of me and let it go out of bounds so that they would retain possession of the ball, which I guess is sound strategy, except he like drilled me in the chest, like hit me as hard as, uh, as, hard as he could, I guess. So I did what any normal red-blooded junior high kid would do. I punched him in the face. <laughs> punched him in the face. We got into an altercation. Um, my parents were there. The team was there. I was obviously ejected from the game, uh, suspended from the next one. And from then forward, my teammates called me Dennis Rodman. So there we go, which totally makes sense, I guess. Yeah, all the tattoos that I have, clearly we very similar. At the time, it's funny now, right? But at the time, I was incredibly embarrassed. I was ashamed. When I get really, really angry, and this hasn't happened in a long time, I cry. And so I was mad. I was embarrassed. I was kind of crying, not too much. I had something in my eye. And I was so ashamed. And I, was, I felt like I'd left my, let my team down. I thought I was going to get in super trouble when I got home. Uh, my parents were watching the game. And all I could think about that day was what I had done wrong and how I'd let it get to that point. I should have had better control of myself. And there are seasons in your life where all you can focus on are the things that you're ashamed of, the things that you're worried about, the things that you feel like you've messed up. Shame is kind of a response to a failure or a perceived failure. And so you start focusing in on your failures, you start feeling embarrassed that you've done something wrong because we kind of have a perfectionism thing in our culture. And so we become ashamed and it's easy for us to be ashamed. So I want us to talk about today how we deal with shame and how we deal with it biblically, not the way our culture wants us to deal with it, which depending on where you live is pretty much just shove it in a box and don't talk about it. Let's talk about how the Bible talks about us dealing with shame, dealing with failure, and we're in a great place to do that. We're in Genesis 3. We're doing our year of the Bible study. We're starting with a series called Beginnings. We did creation last week, which is great. And now we're talking about kind of the middle part of this story that things get a little rough, a little rocky, a little tragic. So we're in Genesis 3, and we're going to do the whole uh, chapter today. So one of the best ways that we can stave off failure and shame is to do what? Not fail, right? Not fail. And one of the ways that we do this spiritually, one of the ways we uh, kind of prevent shame from taking over our lives spiritually is to actually be obedient, to do what God has called us to do. So we must discover God's word. We have to discover what God's word has told us to do so that we don't have to be ashamed anymore. So from Genesis 1, 26 to 27, we learn that Adam and Eve were created for a purpose. Let's read what this purpose is. 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. So they're given a job. And being made in the image of God means a lot of things. One of its primary uh, purposes is that they are supposed to rule and reign over creation. This is somewhat of a pejorative term in our society, but Adam and Eve are basically in middle management. They are governors. They're responsible in representing the king of the universe, God, to the rest of creation. Now, for you to be successful in this job, you need to know what the intention, what the heart is behind what God wants, and then to do it. You need to know what his word says, and you need to do it. Adam and Eve kind of fail on both counts. They need to govern themselves and they need to govern creation around them. And we kind of fail. They kind of failed. 
Because contained within God's word are two things that we desperately need to be successful image bearers of God and to stave off failure and shame. We need his truth and we need his love. We must discover God's word for his truth. Look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? All right, so what's going on here? One, there is a talking snake which is concerning. Now, we read this as readers, and we think animals don't typically talk, regardless of what Disney tells us. They don't talk. Now, Eve does not seem to be caught off guard by this. There could be a couple of reasons for this. One, part of the serpent's deception, which, by the way, the serpent is Satan. It's a possessed serpent. Satan is pulling the strings here, and we learn that in Revelation, that that's what's going on. So part of the serpent's deception might be to kind of cloud Eve's ability to perceive the fact that this is weird, that a serpent shouldn't be telling me what to do because I'm ruling and reigning over creation on behalf of God. The other possibility is that Eve was not created when Adam named all the animals, So Eve may not know what a serpent says. So if you ask my daughter, who's two, what's a cow say? She says, moo. What's a chicken say? She says, cluck. If you asked Eve what a serpent says, she'd be like, she asked me questions. Serpent just asked questions. I don't know. Eve hasn't maybe met all of the animals yet. So whatever's going on, we know something is weird about this story, particularly in a story that has supernatural produce and literal Banana Republic clothing. (laughs) The serpent seems out of place. But he does roll up and he asks a question. Did God really say? What did God really say? And she responds almost like she's supposed to. Look at verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. She should have stopped there, but she didn't. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. So she responds. She quotes God's word back to the serpent, but she doesn't do it accurately. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. 2 verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So there's two things you need to know about that passage. One, God says to the man, which tells us where's Eve at this point. She's not alive yet. She hadn't been created. So God tells the man not to eat of the fruit. So whose job is it to tell Eve what to do? It was Adam's job. Adam was supposed to teach her. Now, there's a possibility that he didn't do a very good job, or he said, you know what? Let's let's not even think about eating it. Why don't we not even touch it? And so he adds to God's command, possibly. In any case, they both think that they're not supposed to touch the fruit. You will meet people You will see things in culture, you will see things in your society, they're going to ask you questions. And it's not going to sound exactly like what the serpent did, but I promise you, you can almost find a way to put in the words, did God really say? Culture around you wants you to conform. That's what they want. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. There's nothing wrong with some forms of conformity. But culture around us wants us to conform, and when we allow our relationship with God to be higher than what culture wants, it creates friction, right? creates a, 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 a sort of uh, dissonance within us. So you're going to have culture come to you, and culture's going to say, did God really say, don't be so focused on money rather than the worship of God? Did God really say that money's not that important? Did God really say that that's a secondary issue in your life? Did God really say you needed to be together with other believers regularly? Did God really say that Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God? Did God really say that? Did God say, worship me and worship me alone. Did he really say that? And so one of the reasons why we feel like failures, and one of the reasons why we feel ashamed, is because we as believers, as followers of Jesus, are constantly trying to please two masters. We have culture over here saying one thing, and we have the Lord over here saying something else. And if you're not careful, if you don't know what God's word says, And this is one of the reasons why we're doing the year of the Bible, while we're walking through Scripture, while we want you to be reading Scripture with us. One of the reasons why we're doing this is because we want you to know what God's Word says. But often we don't know what God's Word says, and so when culture comes to us with a new idea, we kind of pair it with something that God taught so that we can make it okay. 
So something that Oprah said or something we read on a blog or something that comes on Twitter and we combine it with what God says and we're like, oh yeah, God really does want me to have that. And what it does is it creates this Frankenstein faith. It doesn't look like honoring God and it creates shame and it creates failure in our life because God wants and actually demands your total allegiance. But culture does too. And so what happens to many of us, this happens to me, is I feel like I'm not successful over here in culture's world. I'm not living my best life now. I'm not doing what I want to do over here. But I'm also not feeling like I'm not pleasing God. And it creates this sense of dissonance and failure and shame. Because I don't know what God's word says. When you're not rooted and grounded in the truth of scripture, it can be really easy to be ashamed. But we also need God's word. We need to discover God's word because... It tells us about God's love. We must discover God's word for his love. Look at verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and knowing evil. The serpent's plan here is to do two things. One, he wants to minimize the punishment that God has said will happen if they eat of the fruit, which he does successfully. And he wants Eve to start to question God's love for her. Come on. God knows that when you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. That makes you a threat. God's holding you back. He doesn't want you to be everything that you could be. He doesn't love you. He doesn't have humanity's best interests at heart. Take the fruit for yourself. Take the fruit for yourself. And it starts a pattern of thinking in Eve's mind. She's like, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe God doesn't have our best interest in mind. It says in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Because Eve does not remember exactly what God said, and because Satan has effectively deceived her, she begins to question God's goodness. And when we question God's goodness, when we question God's love, what we start to do is to rely on our natural, practical facilities to make decisions, right? Because that's what it says. Look at verse 6 again. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. By the way, that word good, the last time it was used, was when God was making things and saying it was good. So Eve is making a pronouncement. This is a good thing to do. It's righteous for me to do this. And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. That wise means practically successful. For Eve, the ends justify the means. I'm not going to be a failure. I'm not going to ever be ashamed. I can do what I need to do because I can be ethically autonomous. I can be in charge of my own life and my husband can too. She questions God's goodness. And when we question God's goodness and we question uh, his word, and not in a helpful way of being like, what did God say? I want to know for myself. But when we begin to question whether or not God's intention behind it is good, we start relying on our own practical fa facilities on their own independently, and we wind up making really bad decisions because we ask ourselves, if God really loved me, I would be comfortable and I'd never be challenged in any way. If God really loved me, he never asked me to do anything I don't want to do. If God really loved me, I'd have the exact spouse that I want and I'd have the kids that I want too. If God really loved me, I'd never fail at a test or at my job, I'd never get laid off if God really loved me. But if you're not in God's word regularly, if you're not seeking to understand it and to grow in it, you'll rely on common sense, you'll rely on ambition, you'll rely on, rely on practicality, and you'll continue to perpetuate that thing that Adam and Eve started in the garden. A great example is moving in together. For a couple that's not married to move in together, I understand we're in 2019, and this is a pretty common practice. And practically, I'll be honest, it makes total sense to me. You save money, right? One rent, one room, it's great. Save money. Uh, you see if you're sexually compatible, which is helpful in relationships. And you get to see like if you'll work as a married couple living together. It totally makes sense. There's only really two problems. One, statistically, relationships that move in together before marriage are more likely to fail. But let's push that practical aspect aside. The other one is, God's word says not to. God's word challenges us constantly in the face of sexual immorality. And that means a whole host of things. 
even though practically it looks like a good idea, God says, no, don't. Don't. And again, I sympathize with the practicality part. I do. But God's word is over here saying, no, that's not what I want for you. That's not how you be the best human that you can be. And God, as our creator, knows how we can operate as the best humans that we can be. This is, again, why we want to do Year of the Bible. So that you can know and you can grasp what it is, not only what God has for you, but his intention behind it which is a love, and to help you become the person that you've been created to be. So we need to be in the Word. That's how we stave off shame and failure. Here's the problem, though. We fail a lot. We get ashamed a lot. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. There are things that I'm ashamed of that go beyond punching a kid in a basketball game. So what do we do instead of being in the Word? Well, often we try to cover up our shame, right? We spend a lot of time and energy covering up our shame. Now, the consequences of Adam and Eve's action when they eat the fruit isn't readily apparent to them, but they do know that something's wrong. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. So the first thing they do is they cover up their shame from one another. They cover up their shame from one another. The first clue that Adam and Eve know that something has gone horribly wrong is that they notice that the other one is naked. Now, this is not like, oh, Noticing you for the first time. You look mighty nice. It's not that kind of noticing somebody. You ever had that dream where you're doing public speaking and everybody's laughing at you and you look down and you're buck nude? And then you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed, I'm so ashamed. This is what they're going through, except the nightmare is real and they don't wake up. So what do they do? They sew some fig leaves together, right? That was the literal Banana Republic joke that I was looking for that I think some of you missed. Banana leaves, right? So they go about covering up. Now, what do they cover up? What did they use to to get the fruit and to eat the fruit? What did they use? How do you eat? Hands, mouth, they use their eyes, right? But what do they wind up covering up with the fig leaves? They don't cover up the items that they use to sin. No, they cover up their private parts, Why? Why would you cover that up? It's vulnerable. It's also the way that you know that you're different. Adam has a mouth, Eve has a mouth. Adam has eyes, Eve has eyes. But then they notice there are parts of them that aren't the same. And if I have something that you don't have, and you have something that I don't have, I'm vulnerable. You could take that from me. You could abuse that. I'm vulnerable. So they cover it up. They hide. They hide from each other. They cover their shame. We cover up our vulnerabilities all the time. When we feel exposed, when we fail, we want to hide. Social media is a digital fig leaf. That's what it is. I present the best me forward, and I hide the parts of me that aren't so pleasing to the eye. I think I've made this joke before, but people snap pictures of the food they eat. They don't snap pictures of them writhing on the floor with food poisoning. Right? That's embarrassing. They're a fail, they feel like a failure. Why do we post pictures of us in like an outfit that we think look, re- looks really good, but we'll never post the picture that shows that one wrinkle of back fat that everyone has? Even you with the 1% body fat, you got it too. You work out all you want. It stays right there. You're not going to post that picture. Why? You're embarrassed and ashamed of it. You're like, no, I want people to think I look good. I look right. Why is it that people post so many pictures of their wedding day? But the day that they go for, to get the divorce finalized, nobody posts a picture with a certificate that says, divorce finalized, yay. You know why nobody does that? Because they feel, I'm not saying that they failed, but they feel like they failed. And they feel ashamed. And we want to hide. We want to hide. We want our successes to be seen. We want to hide in our failures. I want to think about something that we did earlier today. We got up and we shook each other's hands. My guess is about 75% of this room really hates when we do that. (laughs) We did that on purpose because it's awkward. And many of you probably feel like your fig leaf is showing when you're out there. It's vulnerable. I'm meeting people that I don't know for the first time. Got to give them my name. I got to talk about myself for a little bit. I'm on. All of a sudden you go from being totally anonymous in a dark room to like all of a sudden face to face with a human being. That's a quick transition. 
We want to hide. So we cover up from one another. We also cover up from God. Look at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they've used one leaf or a group of leaves to cover up from each other. But then they recognize God is coming and they're like, "Mm, a fig leaf ain't going to do this. If we're going to hide from him, we're going to have to hide. We're going to have to upgrade the fig leaf to like an entire tree or forest of trees. Right? Which is ironic considering they used a tree to violate God's command, and now they're using trees to hide from God. When we fail to obey God, which failing to obey God is simply this, you stop trusting him for his word to be truthful, and you stop trusting his love for you, and you go and do something else. You go and be ethically autonomous. That's what Adam and Eve wanted. Adam and Eve knew right from wrong. Eating from the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they knew what was wrong. They knew not to eat from the tree. But by eating, they achieved ethical autonomy. They wanted to make their own decisions about what was right and what was wrong. And that looks like not trusting God for his love and his truth. And so when we disobey God, we want to hide. and We want to hide from him. And Adam and Eve, we're just like them. We're constantly searching for upgrades to our fig leaf, right? And typically the way this looks looks for us in our relationship with God is we try to do good works. Look, most of us know we're not perfect people. Most of us know we're not, even maybe even venture to say, good people. So what we do is we try and pile on the good works, the good works. I'm going to be a good husband, I'm going to be a good mother, I'm going to be a good father, I'm going to be a good employee, I'm going to be a good friend, and that will somehow put up enough trees, I'll collect enough trees, that God won't see my nakedness anymore. He won't see my sin anymore, and I'll balance it out. And this makes sense when you think about the way we interact with everyone else in our lives. We try to balance the budget sheet. If I do something to hurt my wife's feelings, what do I do? I go buy her some flowers and chocolates, right, to balance it out. If my kids disobey me, I punish them, and that restores the balance of power. They get grounded for a month, they do laundry for a month, and guess what? All of a sudden, they're respectful again, I guess. Probably not. I don't know. If I screw up at work, and there's a threat of being fired, I work really hard for the next three months to outweigh the failure that I had. We have a lot of transactional relationships in our life, so we just automatically assume that our relationship with God is transactional. Yeah, I've done some bad stuff, but God, if you give me a chance, I can really, really outweigh that on my own, and that's not the case. God sees through the fig leaves. He sees through the trees. God's never had the problem of not being able to see the forest for the trees, and he just looks at us, and he sees us for who we really are. And so when this happens, do you know what we do? We know that our, 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 our fig leaves and our, our, our trees aren't working anymore. You know what we do? We start throwing blame around. We cover up by blaming each other. Look at this, uh, starting in verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, I want you to notice how he blames two people in one sentence. The woman whom you gave to me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? I can't think of any more tragic, a more tragic question. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. What is this you have done? We blame other people, right? And Adam is probably the worst offender because he blames somebody else and he blames God. So rather than owning up to it, so when we have shame, when we have failure in our life and we have a relationship with God, what we need to do is confess and repent. We need to come to him with what we have, as dark and as dirty as you might feel with it. You've got to say, God, this is, this is what I'm doing right now. This is what I have done. Please forgive me. And that's what they should have done, Adam and Eve. They should have said, Lord, we ate from the fruit and we're really sorry. I'm not saying anything would have changed. But that would have been an appropriate faith-based response. A person of faith confesses and repents before God. A person who is not walking in faith blames everybody else. So when I fail, when I have shame in my life, what do I do? It's my wife's fault. I'm really bad about this, actually, as a, as a person. Uh, Christmas, a uh, week before uh, Christmas, actually, I had the week off, so the Monday before Christmas Eve, uh, I decided to wait to buy my wife's Christmas gifts until then. I had time off. It was a good idea. It was a sound strategy, except 
somebody had already bought most of the things. Most of everybody else had already bought their gifts. So her list was already pretty much taken up. So I'm driving around Dallas the week before Christmas, trying to find a gift that I don't know what to get my wife. And you know who I blamed and got angry at while I was driving around? It wasn't me for waiting so long. It wasn't all the other people who bought gifts. It was my wife, because she had the audacity to want a gift. (laughs) How dare she want something as a token of my love and affection? If there are things that I'm ashamed of and things that I fail at in my life, I blame you, and I blame you, and I blame you, and I blame you. I blame my mom and dad. I blame my upbringing. I blame my education. I blame my social situation. I blame that things aren't fair. And in some cases, those might be true. Eve was right. The serpent did deceive her. But she's still responsible. We like to throw blame around rather than confess and repent. And the problem is that God sees through the fig leaves, he sees through the trees, and he sees through the blame game. And if you don't know who God is, if you don't know the intention behind his word, if you don't know that he loves you, the fact that he sees through every smoke screen you ever try to throw up should scare you to death. Just like it scared Adam and Eve. And if you read Genesis 3 and you don't understand that God loves us, the second half of Genesis 3 is really hard to read. But if you know God, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you read the second half of Genesis 3 in a new way because God covers our shame. God covers our shame. When we have shame, rather than throwing blame around, we go to God with what we're ashamed of. So, uh, it's, like I said, it's really easy to read this passage and think that God is, is just laying the hammer down on Adam and Eve and that he's being really harsh. And I understand that reading. That's probably how I read it most of my life. There's two things going on that you need to know. One, uh, it's okay that God is punishing Adam and Eve and the serpent for that matter. He's God. He's the creator of the universe. He made each and everything that is there, that is here. And as creator, it's his right to do with his creation as he wills. It's hard for us to grasp because we're autonomous creatures. But if I go home today and bake a pie, which won't happen, But if I were to go home and bake a pie, and it was the most amazing pie in the world, and I take it and I throw it in the grass, not trying any of it, it's my right to do that because it's my pie. Secondly, God is holy. He's just. God is the standard of morality and right doing in our world. And he has to punish evil. He has to punish wrongdoing. So keep that in mind as you're reading. Now, as I read the punishments, I'm not going to have time to get into a bunch of things like what does Eve's punishment mean for today and all that stuff. Maybe another time we'll talk about that. But what I want you to see is that each character, the serpent, Eve, and then Adam, is met with two things in their punishment. They're met with a humbling aspect. So there's something there to humble them. And then there's something that ultimately leads to their defeat. So I'm going to read through it and just keep that in mind as we're reading. So verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Humility. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Defeat. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall shall bring forth children. Humility. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you defeat. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread, humility, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return defeat." If you read this on the surface, it just looks like God is really laying down the hammer. But really what's happening is God's covering their shame. And the first thing he covers their shame is with hope. With hope. In in verse 14, there's the curse on the serpent. And there's a little phrase in here, there's a little section that's kind of cool. Sorry, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first time the gospel is preached in Scripture. Because God is saying that there will come someone who was born of a woman, 
who will take all the sin, all the brokenness, all the shame, all the hurt, all the defeat, all the humiliation that we feel. And he's going to take it on himself and he's going to pay for it. And he's going to look like he's been defeated. That's the bruise your heel part. But what he's really going to do is crush and defeat the plans of the serpent. One of my favorite paintings, it's the only painting that ever makes me cry, is this painting here. It's called Mary Comforts Eve. And in that painting, uh, you see Eve holding the fruit, but reaching out to the womb of Mary. Look at her eyes. Those are the eyes of someone that, to me, almost looks afraid to hope. And some of us are in the middle of shame right now that we're afraid to hope that God could deliver us from it. But I want you to look down at the foot of Mary. What's she standing on? A serpent's head. Now, it's a little Catholic. I'll admit that. But Jesus Christ ultimately crushes the head of the serpent. Jesus Christ wants whatever shame you have. He wants you to take it to him. If you're not a believer, that means that you confess that you've done things that violate God's command and you want Jesus to pay for it. And you believe that his payment on the cross, he was crucified, he was buried and was resurrected, and you believe that he's going to pay for it for you. And that's how you become a Christian. You give him your shame. You give him your failures. And he makes it right with God. If you're a believer, guess what? It just means the same thing. Just because you've been forgiven one time doesn't mean you, need to be, doesn't mean you don't need to be forgiven again and again and again. Because as we grow in sanctification, as we grow in righteousness, guess what we do? We still make mistakes. We still fail. And we still get ashamed. And Jesus says, come to me. Confess and repent. And I will give you hope. Hope. Because one day, one day there's going to be a day where there's not a serpent. There's not brokenness. There's not shame. There's only the Lord. And so God covers our shame with hope. But he also covers our shame with love. He covers our shame with love. I want you to look at verse uh, 20. And the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all of the living. So this is part of the hope, part of the love concept here. Adam, here's what God says. And if you just read that passage initially, you think to yourself, oh man, that's just Adam like naming his wife. Cool. No, he names her the mother of all the living. Notice what he doesn't name her. Failure. Screw up. You're the one that ruined this. You led me into this. You, you did this to me. He doesn't keep blaming her. Again, he's just as much to blame as she is. But he names her something hopeful because he believes God prom- God's promise that there's going to be somebody who's going to reverse the curse of death. And it's because God loves them. Look at what God does in verse 21. And the Lord God made skins... So God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man out of the east of the garden of Eden and he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now again, it looks like maybe God is being harsh here. He's kicking them out of the garden, but he's not. One, he clothes them in skins, which are hardier, which are sturdier, which are able to brave the elements better than some vegetables that somebody's sewn together. God makes them for them. He loves them enough to make something for them, to clothe them. And he wants to clothe you today in his love. He wants to clothe you in his righteousness. He wants to clothe you in his glory. He wants to share his glory with you. Because we're adopted into the family of God when we believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He wants to share that with you. The second thing he does is he drives them out of the garden. He doesn't want them to eat of the fruit that would allow them to live forever in a state of fallen depravity. He doesn't want them to stay in their shame. He has a plan to rescue them. And yeah, it requires them to go and live in a harsh world and to actually die. But God has a plan to send his son. And you'll begin to see as you read Genesis, uh, you can go back and read uh, chapter four and we'll talk about it next week. Eve says, she names her son Cain because with the help of the Lord, I've gotten a man or the man, the man that's gonna rescue us. Now we know that Cain disappoints. 
But then Noah is maybe the one. So constantly throughout Scripture, we're looking for the guy that's going to bring hope. We're looking for the Messiah. From Genesis 3 forward, we're looking for Jesus Christ. And I bet today you are looking for someone to take your shame away, to take your failures away. You need to look no longer. It is Christ the Lord. And when he does that, we learn his word. We learn what he has to say about himself, about who God is. And we try to do it. And when we fail, we don't blame other people. We don't try and cover it up and hide it. We own it. We bring it before the Lord. We bring it before those that we've hurt. We seek forgiveness. And then we repent. We change the way we're living. Because God wants to cover over your shame with hope and with love. No matter what it is that you've done, there's hope and there's love for you today. So when you leave this place, don't be ashamed. Be hopeful. And know that you're loved. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we know that you are a kind God. It's all over the pages of Scripture. You're a God who has looked and seen that your, your people are helpless. We can't save ourselves. And so rather than, than coming to us as, as a harsh judge, Lord God, you've come to us as a caring and loving Father who's willing to sacrifice to bring us into a relationship with you, and then from there forward to be kind to us. And it is that kindness that drives us to you, that, that gives us the, the freedom and the, the, the boldness to confess before you and to change the way they live, to repent, to change who we are, and to trust that your Spirit is working to change us, to make us more into your image. And so, God, I pray today that we would stop buying the lies of Satan, buying the lives of the world around us, and would instead look to you to tell us who we are, to tell us what you've done for us, and to tell us that we don't need to be ashamed anymore, that there's freedom from that. So God, I pray that you would set your people free today. I pray all these things in your son's name.